body and Glenn is out the second. Okay, we'll start with this. On the undercard of Amir Khan and Kel Brock's big showdown, the long-anticipated, long-awaited grudge match, we're going to be seeing Ms. Great Britain, Natasha Jonas, vie for what is the vacant WBO title in the junior middleweight division against former junior middleweight champion, former IBF junior middleweight champion, Chris Namis. And I got to tell you, it's a very different fight than what the Eva Piatkowska fight would have been. Eva Piatkowska, who was unable to enter into the country due to COVID protocols. It's something to do with COVID. I'm not sure if it's COVID protocols or if Eva contracted COVID-19 herself. In any event, Chris Namis is standing in her place on short notice. She is. There are several things working for Chris Namis in this fight, several things working against her. It's working for her. She's got more pro experience than Natasha. She's got more professional experience. She's approximately three years younger and a lot bigger than Natasha. The discrepancy in size is noticeable between Natasha Jonas and Chris Namis. Chris Namis, who is a bona fide junior middleweight. That's what's working for Chris Namis. What's working against her? She's coming right off a decision loss to a in late 2020 and she hasn't boxed since then she hasn't boxed in over a year so there may be considerable ring rust that she tries to shake off coupled with the fact that natasha jonas being the naturally smaller fighter athletic fighter natasha may have the edge in speed and speed and foot speed in spite of natasha being three years older than chris namis natasha might be the sharper fighter natasha's boxed two times in the last 12 months chris has because she's naturally smaller than chris namis she may very well have the edge in hand speed and foot speed and she's going to need to use that use that to her advantage she's got home field advantage as well this won't be the first time that chris namis has traveled abroad to box a clever southpaw clever southpaw like natasha jonas that's what she did well over a year ago as a defending champion with marie eve de care who won a decision over chris namis now marie eve de care is a characteristic pure boxer whereas natasha jonas she's more of a boxer puncher for this fight she may have to take a page out of marie de care's playbook she might have to stay a moving target throughout throughout the entirety of the fight because it does not behoove natasha jonas to punch with chris namis that would allow chris to use her size and power against the naturally smaller natasha jonas who's taking a considerable leap a considerable leap of faith in the junior middleweight division aspiring to become a champion there natasha's got a moving punch she can't afford to get into a brawl natasha jonas the southpaw chris namis the orthodox fighter it behooves natasha to sharpshoot pick her punches place them well and play at the angles stay on the outside of chris's jam natasha must move to her right staying on the outside of chris namis's left her left hand her lead hand her jab hand, because in all likelihood, Chris Namis is going to be front foot heavy in this fight, looking to impose her size, durability, and power on the naturally smaller Natasha Jonas. This is a fight that Natasha has to win with her feet more than her hands, on the balls of those feet. Stand on the move. I expect that Chris Namis will be the aggressor, and I expect that Natasha Jonas in this fight, she will be the defender. I expect that Natasha Jonas, if she is to win this fight, she's going to have to move and punch, pick her punches, sharp shoot. Stay light on her feet. Use the fundamentals because Chris Namis, she's big, but she swings wide. There's not much hope of knocking her down, not much hope of knocking her out. She's naturally bigger, experienced, and durable. So the only way for Natasha Jonas to win this thing is to keep it a boxing match. Chris is big, but she ain't too accurate. Looping shots and wide hooks. There's plenty of room in between there for Natasha Jonas, who's naturally smaller, to get under and around those shots. Play shots of her own, perhaps to Chris Namis' midsection, to slow her down. Chris has more of a flick jab. Chris Namis doesn't fire a stiff stick with that lead hand it's more of a short jab that she sometimes doubles up on as she's stepping forward looking to bring over that big right hand i think the lead left hand 
for Natasha Jonas could be a very important punch in this fight. The lead left hand, Natasha's straight left hand, Natasha's backhand, her power hand, could be a very important punch in this fight. Chris Namis is big, experienced, and durable, but she's got leaky defense. She can be caught. She's there for the shots. The trick is balancing offense and defense. You don't want to stay in the pocket with the naturally bigger fighter that's looking to impose their size on you. You got to place your shots, you get out of there. I'd be lying to you if I told you that Natasha isn't under grave threat of being knocked out. She is. Chris isn't a characteristically big, big puncher as far as junior middleweights go, but we all know that Natasha Jonas isn't a bona fide junior middleweight herself. She's a smaller fighter, a much smaller fighter, moving up in weight. Thus, Natasha must resort to her amateur background, her pedigree. Fight for points. Keep it a boxing match, win the rounds. It's a tall ask, it is, I won't lie to you, but Natasha Jonas can pull it off because she is a better boxer than Chris Namis. More accurate puncher. She's just smaller. Use your feet and stay the fuck off the line. Don't stand in one spot too long and don't look to assert yourself in the pocket. Don't get into exchanges with Chris Namis. It's hit and not get hit for this one. I'm backing Natasha Jonas to win and win on points. Perhaps I am thinking more with my heart instead of my head. I'm okay with that. I'm not going to apologize for it. Natasha Jonas on points is the pick to become this division's WBO champion tomorrow night. In other news, per a tweet from Michael Benson, DAZN have announced that billionaire backer Len Blavatnik has agreed to a $4.3 billion capital injection, making them debt-free. DAZN chairman Kevin Mayer said the recapitalization represents a strong vote of confidence in DAZN's strategy, progress, and future growth opportunities. And there have been a lot of people, for whatever reason, that have been waiting for DAZN to fail, waiting for DAZN to go under, though I don't know why, since the sports streaming app Hopes to. brings big fights to fight fans, among other sports, at a reduced price than either Fox or Showtime. I don't know, maybe these guys like paying $80 for a regular fight. Maybe these guys don't mind paying 80 bucks a pop for a pay-per-view several times a year by way of Fox, by way of Showtime. Your guess is as good as mine. What kind of misguided tribalism leads these individuals to... There's some guys out there they want the zone to fail. God only knows why. And what this news heralds is the continued efforts of DAZN, the streaming app, to attempt to corner the sporting market around the world. They are essentially debt free now. Whatever debt they amassed before has been wiped clean with this injection. This injection of $4.3 billion. What that communicates is that Len Blavatnik believes in this endeavor. Continues to believe in it, backs it financially, and is staying the course. I think what most people don't realize is that there was always going to be a debt amassed by a streaming app attempting to break through what is an already established market. In order to make an omelet, you gotta crack a couple of eggs. You gotta to make some mistakes. A lot has happened. Some things have changed. John Skipper's not with them anymore. Kevin Mayer has taken his place, and with any endeavor like this one, there are growing pains. It takes money to make money. When DAZN first debuted in America, a lot of people highlighted the amount of spending they saw from the streaming app, how much money they were throwing at these fights, and how that money didn't necessarily represent the market value of those fights at that time. I mean, $7 million to Mikey Garcia for a Jesse Vargas fight? To make a name for yourself in all these different markets, you might have to overspend. It's all a part of the process. It never heralded the end of DAZN like some folks would have had you believe. And this is confirmation of that. With this $4.3 billion injection, they can take everything they've learned and fine-tune their strategy. It takes money to make money. Don't let anybody tell you different. You've got to pay to play. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. One of two things have changed, but the endeavor itself remains the same. And Len Blavatnik appears to be staying the course because he believes in this product. He believes in DAZN. We've got a lot of competition, and we're not just talking about the United States. I mean, as far as the boxing goes, as far as boxing, they've got to compete with Sky Sports as a platform and box as a promotional outfit. We know they were attempting to purchase BT Sport, which would have potentially brought Queensbury Promotions into the fray onto the DAZN platform, but that didn't work out. That didn't happen. So BT and Queensbury remain DAZN's competitor. This $4.3 billion injection effectively wipes the slate clean for DAZN and allows them to fine-tune their business strategy with all the information they've gathered, everything they've learned about all these different markets. Those things in mind, I'm expecting big things to happen this year. The UK market is now a lot more competitive than it used to be, and that might make Eddie's job harder and Ben Shalom's and Frank Warren's, but for the fight fans, a competitive market... A competitive market yields more content for the fight fans and more opportunities for the fighters themselves.
In other news, I'm sure most of you have come across this by now. A bit of information that got a lot of attention late yesterday, perhaps some of that attention unwanted. Mike Copinger tweeted that Canelo has agreed to a two-fight deal with Matchroom Boxing for his own pay-per-view bouts against Dimitri Bivol in May and Triple G in September. Bivol had signed his contract, but Triple G had not agreed to his portion. No deal can become official until all three parties sign. That was according to Mike Coppinger via his sources. So according to Canelo Alvarez himself, he stated, I didn't even agree. I'm still negotiating. Don't lie to people. The day everything is signed, that day, I'll let them know. For now... There's nothing concrete. And it's important to note that Mike Coppinger didn't state that the deal was finalized, that the deal was done. He did state that the deal was pending, pending Gennady Golovkin's approval of the deal, that there were still some kinks that needed to be ironed out. I mean, I think it's important to note that before piling on Mike Coppinger, though I might be a day late and a dollar short. Boxing insider Rick Glacier stated, To all those that think they know, I will tell you right here and right now, Mike Coppinger will be vindicated for the Canelo situation, and there's now a new hashtag, hashtag bet on cop. Anyone can rip, but don't rip until you know all the real facts, and I know the real facts. It seems that Boxing Insider Rick Glacier's sources are corroborating what Mike Coppinger's sources are telling him. It seems that Rick is vouching for Mike and Mike's information. But if Mike's information is on the money, why'd Canelo call him out? What could have been because of how much attention the story was getting in such a short amount of time. It seems that the entire world of boxing is waiting for Canelo Alvarez's decision, which direction he's going to go in, that the slightest hint of inside intel grabs everybody's attention. Brings everything to a standstill. I will say it does seem like Canelo Alvarez is leaning towards the zones two-fight deal as opposed to what he was being offered by the PBC because not that long ago, David Benavidez of the PBC, he stated that he believes Jamal Trullo and Caleb Plant are going to fight each other. And if they're fighting each other, they're not fighting Canelo. Jamal Charlo isn't. Jamal Charlo, who is reported to be in the running for a Canelo Alvarez fight, that is, he was reported... Well, he was reported to be in the running for a Canelo fight, though we don't know if he is now. He might not be. If Mike Copinger's story checks out, he will be, in fact, vindicated. But now we're just playing the waiting game. Canelo Alvarez's next move, whatever it ends up being, directly affects the landscape anywhere from 160 to 100. 168 to as high as 175 pounds. Thus, any information in regards to that story gets a lot of attention and it gets it quickly. Perhaps that's the reason Canelo Alvarez thought it prudent to dispel any rumors that are out there. Even if there is some truth to those rumors. In reference to conversations that are happening behind the scenes, behind closed doors, away from the prying eyes of the boxing community. Canelo don't want people in his business. Finally, just in keeping with the theme of all things Canelo and potentially disown, David Benavidez is confident he's on the right track to land a Canelo Alvarez fight in the near future. He claims we're in a good position, and I don't know what that's based on. I don't know what position he thinks he's in. He stated, I feel like we're in a good position, too, because I'm on PBC, obviously, Benavidez told FightHype.com. I think Canelo is loving that pay-per-view money. It's way more money with pay-per-view, so I feel like we're in a good position. It is what it is. Hopefully, I get my opportunity after. It's likely talking about after the David Lemieux fight. And after Canelo Alvarez has his next fight, depending on whoever it is, he ends up fighting. We still don't know. That's a big question, Benavidez said. I'm not really 100% sure. I guess the only factor at play is that Charlo was a champion at 160 pounds, so they're probably going to give him the opportunity first. Yeah, if Jermon Charlo gets the opportunity at all. Things are so topsy-turvy when it comes to Canelo Alvarez that one minute David Benavidez is telling you he thinks that Jermon Charlo and Caleb Plant are about to fight, and the next minute he tells you that Canelo Alvarez might end up fighting Jermon Charlo instead of Caleb Plant. The truth is that nobody knows because everybody is at Canelo Alvarez's mercy. Every single one of these guys. David Benavidez included. David Benavidez who says, I think the fight with Charlo is going to be the toughest fight for for Canelo that he's had in a while. Benavidez continued, I wouldn't also be surprised if Canelo knocks Charlo out. Benavidez, who is reportedly set to face Quebec's David Lemieux in his next bout, views
use his current position as win-win. I'm in a good position, Benavidez said. I want to fight with both of these guys. If Canelo wins, I get a fight with Canelo. If Charlo wins, I get a fight with Charlo. So those are two fights that I want anyway. Bear in mind it was David Benavidez that said he thinks Jamal Charlo's next fight is going to be Caleb Plant. The way I see it, if Canelo Alvarez don't take the PBC's offer and he don't box Jamal Charlo next, you know, he goes ahead, he fights Dimitri Bivol, he does whatever it is he does, Jamal probably ends up fighting Caleb. And then after that fight, David would be in the running for a Jamal Charlo fight. Though it's not a guarantee because for years we saw that the PBC had two reigning champions in the featherweight division, Leo Santa Cruz and Gary Russell Jr., two champions whose reigns paralleled each other, and they never fought. Who's to say that don't happen between David and Jamal? David Benavidez thinks he's in a good position to land that Canelo Alvarez fight because he says he's a PBC fighter, because he says Canelo Alvarez likes that pay-per-view money, not realizing DAZN has pay-per-view functionality as well. DAZN we talked about earlier, DAZN that just got a $4.3 billion injection to wipe the slate clean for all the debts they've amassed over time. Now DAZN, like some premium cable networks, can offer Canelo Alvarez an incentivized offer that includes a pay-per-view upside. To Play that game. And given the amounts of guaranteed cash it takes to play, it takes to pay Canelo Alvarez to go into business with him and stage one of his fights, what I think David's not realizing is the upside of a pay-per-view on Showtime can't be all that much when you're guaranteeing Canelo something like, I don't know, $40 million? What are we talking about? $50 million in guaranteed prices? 40 to Canelo and approximately 10 to his victim. With guaranteed prices like that coupled with the operational costs it takes to stage a card the upside of the pay-per-view is nominal if there even is one i mean with guaranteed places like that and other operational costs you'd be lucky if there even is an upside to the pay-per-view i think a lot of people got a lot of gross misapprehensions about pay-per-view in a nutshell if you don't surpass the break-even point of the pay-per-view there ain't no upside and given how much money you have to guarantee canelo just canelo not even counting the guy that he's fighting the break-even point of the pay-per-view is very hard to hit but david thinks he's in a good position to get the fight because of pay-per-view as if the pbc are the only guys out there that can provide canelo alvarez that option. What's David Benavidez got that Dimitri Bivol ain't got? Jermo Cholo or Gennady Golovkin? As somebody else, if you're gonna go as far as saying that you're in a good position, okay, what makes you stand out? What exactly makes your position, the position you're in, a good position? I'm not trying to poo-poo all over the guy. I'm just saying that there's nothing about the position David's in that makes David stand out. Makes him distinguishable from anybody else.